Good morning, Professor Infante. Thank you very much for accepting this interview because the topics you deal with in your books are very interesting to me. So thank you again. Before starting with the first question, I make this premise. As a child, I had three certainties. The first one, that man evolved from a monkey. The second one is that the earth revolves around the sun. And the third was that the state prints the banknotes and coins and the quantity of money issued. We were told this since we were children and must be covered by real gold that is from the gold reserve. However, since I grew up, I have profoundly changed the first and third conditions. With respect to the second condition, that the earth revolves around the sun, I am here to learn what conclusions you have arrived at. Following your studies that you reported in your counter-history book of heliocentrism, the question is, Professor, how was your book accepted? And above all, what prompted you to deal with such a particular topic? Where did you start and why? Well, first of all, thank you for having an interest in my books, even though I do not have a notable following. I have been dealing with this topic since 1996, when I first suspected that there was something strange in the birth of modern science. I came into contact with Studi Catholici, the magazine for Catholic studies, and exchanged letters with the editor and the director, which he published one or more than one. A decade later, I released my first book, The Esoteric Roots of Modern Science. It was an idea that wasn't born overnight, it was a long process. It required a process of maturation and then some small confirmation. It must also be considered that at that time there was still no internet. I did not have any available text and I had to research for information to research and develop this topic. Subsequently, I had the opportunity to get in touch with some philosophers of Naples and Salerno. Marcello Caleo and Michele Malatesta. They instructed and guided me a little on the philosophy of science and on the critic of science based on the original text of the authors. Not only on what was said about the authors, but by reading the original texts. Marcello and Michele instructed and guided me in understanding the difference between the expressive text and the hidden meaning. As I become more acquainted with these famous authors like Galileo, I discovered that their written content did not correspond to the hidden meaning that provided the internal logic. So there seemed to be some kind of sibling language throughout this text in which initiators could convey their hidden messages. Could you give us an example of a difference? the difference between the expressed text and the hidden meaning. Differences, yes, there are many. Practically, the Pythagorean method, I knew the Pythagoreans, so Bayard say, they showed how this was done in a school. It is not so much to refer the ancient Pythagorism of Greece, then transferred to Croton with uh, Pythagoras, as for the Pythagorean mentality. The classic example of application of the Pythagorean method is to put the model before reality, that is to believe not so much in what one sees, but in what one thinks. The model before reality is the structure of where the contradiction between the expressed text and the hidden meaning is created. Practically, then I have to say a premise, that is, the criticism that I made does not concern modern science as a whole and speaking against ideological model trumping reality. In fact, the Pythagorean method has been inserted into heliocentrism. It has taught us to deny the evidence of our senses in favor of an ideological model which was built on Pythagorean mysticism, pagan and Egyptian. And from this, the contradiction was created. Okay, I admit my ignorance of your books. I only know the counter story that is the last one. And so let us see the others too. Because it seems to me that there is more than one book. 
Yes, I have written other books. I have them here at my fingertips. This is the very first of uh, uh, 2006 Modern Science, and uh, here is everything that was then developed and expanded on. The exact title, Professor? The Esoteric Roots of Modern Science. The Esoteric Roots of Modern Science? So you sustain that modern science has esoteric roots? Yes, I also try to prove it. The fact is that all of these scientists were involved with the Rosicrucian movement, which was forming in the early 17th century, but they worked underground, underground in an esoteric occult way beginning much earlier. Copernicus, Galileo, Kepler and Newton all had association with this secret society, Freemasonry and Rosicrucianism. There is a portrait of Galileo with a square and what? compass, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Is it just a coincidence? There have been many lodges, many Masonic lodges have been dedicated to Galileo. I asked you before, what prompted you with such a particular topic? Where did you start? Where did this... I already explained this a few years ago. I have an interview where I showed a small symbol that you see here on the cover, here. This is a dialogue from the two greatest system of Galileo, and there, at the bottom, there is a symbol with three dolphins in a circle. Here we have three dolphins in a circle forming the number 666, as each dolphin, taking as a separate element, represents a six, three dolphins, three, six, 666. So I wonder why, why in an astronomy text, this was this 666 sign here. I had begun to sense that there was something strange, and therefore I started a criticism of heliocentrism based on three levels. The first level is the philosophical level, the technical, scientific, astronomical level, and then the doctrinal level. There are three, three categories of contradictions that involve this model here. And they have been inserted into our mentality through this, this heliocentric model. Can you tell us something maybe a little more specific? You said from the philosophical level and then to the technical level? From a scientific and technical point of view. From a scientific and technical point of view, can you give us some evidence? The supposed evidence that uh, has been made to prove the alleged movement of the Earth in reality can be interpreted on the contrary as demonstrating the stillness of the Earth and the movement of the heavens and the sun. There are no absolute movements. All of the motion are relative. Therefore, changing the reference of the system itself also changes the conclusion. And when Foucault's pendulum or the spheres that were dropped from Bologna, from the two towers, it doesn't really prove that the earth is moving. At best, they show that the skies move, and therefore they move. So you say the earth doesn't move. This is my conviction. The earth is firm. In fact, I can prove it because we haven't moved now. <laughs> it is also my belief. Yes. We have something. We have something in common. Yeah, okay. It is also my firm belief. Uh, Aristotle said that it is useless to prove the obvious things. I mean, I don't have to prove that the leaves are on the trees. Just look at them. It would be enough if that were the case. Perhaps we also need to demonstrate the obvious. This is a common sense. Common sense is a certain principle on which we must begin to establish knowledge. If you deny common sense, the philosophy of reality, you get to relativism, to agnosticism, and to idealism, nihilism, etc. But then, what caused the heliocentric hypothesis, I no longer call it a theory, to assert itself? <laughs> Heliocentrism was uh, such an absurd idea that it was immediately rejected by most of the people when it started. Really, it wasn't uh, Copernicus, it was Marsilio Ficino, a Catholic priest who worked in the Medici court 
around 1460. It translated Corpus Hermeticum, with which there was a Egyptian wisdom and a religiosity translated into scientific terms. And in Corpus Hermeticum, there is a reference to the heliocentric model, not so much from the astronomical point of view, but from the spiritual point of view. That is to say, a spiritual ideology was combined with each element, and there was the central spirit, the central fire, the sun that dominated over the other planetary spirits. This model was then transferred from Copernicus in a way as if it were a hypothesis that he has written on a small page, the Commentariolus, another work that was lost. But then, after years, it reworked and he published the Revolutionibus. How then it was imposed, we don't know. I assume it is also discussed in the Galilean letters. In one of the letters, there is a Jesuit who wonders how they managed to impose an idea so impossible to conceive. Perhaps it was a joke. <laughs> because it is beyond the evidence. Why is this important? In the end, what changes for us, for our vision of the world if we adopt either the heliocentric or geocentric hypotheses? What is the difference? What essentially changes for us? Practically speaking, with heliocentrism, our contact with reality has been cut off. When children are born, they see things. They see them, but they don't know what they are. Then, little by little, they understand with teaching, and they give meaning to the things up to a certain point, at least until the Copernican hypothesis is reached. Children learn of the Copernican hypothesis, and this natural contact between observable reality and knowledge is interrupted and cut. Galileo praised Copernicus for having committed violence to the senses with reason. That is, reason does violence to reality. That is, there is no longer what one sees that is attached to the reality, but what one thinks. Accordingly, space is given to practically every hypothesis. Knowledge is no longer attached to reality. Instead, knowledge is attached to thought. Therefore, since thought is infinite, we arrive at idealism, nihilism, where everything becomes possible. It could be said that perhaps by forcing a little that ideology prevails over reality. Yes, this is what I'm saying. Yes, of course, it has imposed itself with the heliocentric model. In the theories of science, they are all excellent. Thermodynamics, thermology, electrotechnical, electronics, electromagnetism. In contrast, this heliocentric model is not science. In fact, in the pure science, knowledge is absolute and perfect. Instead, in this theory, we have the introduction of the Pythagorean mentality, where an abstract mathematical model prevails over reality. I take liberty of saying that maybe something is wrong with what I've also found through Alberto Magno's books concerning medicine. I think that even in medicine, ideology has somewhat replaced science. But I don't think that is appropriate to address this in a short interview, and we do not want to do something extremely long, Professor. In your opinion, what role should science have in society? What should science really strive for? <laughs> Science is the good of humanity and the common good. In fact, this is the case in most sectors, medicine, science, physics, chemistry. Everything is aimed at the good of humanity. In fact, however, sometimes science is manipulated by those who have power, by those who have interests. So, so yes, like wealth. Wealth is in itself is good. But if one uses wealth badly, well, it does not value what he has. Science should be detached as much as possible from power and economic interests. But this, who knows? As a result of your books, have you received any invitations to lecture at a university? <laughs> at the university, no, because I am rejected. These are pure heresies. What I'm saying is something that is valid for me and for you, perhaps. I don't know why, but uh, academia rejected these arguments. Even when I 
was collaborating with the university, I did not present these things that I began to harbor inside me. To understand and develop them, I detach myself and I have a continuum on my own way. At the university you cannot give a lesson against the because it would be like going into church and speaking against the Pope, more or less. Shouldn't science be open to the contribution of anyone who perhaps brings some proven established theory? It should. Why isn't it so, Professor? Because there are dogmas. Science has now become the official religion. We can doubt about God, but we cannot doubt what Galileo said, what Newton said. As if before Galileo and Newton, science did not exist. Angular moments, moments of inertia existed before. Let's consider that the Romans built the bridges, the Colosseum, that is, the Pantheon in Rome, just to give an example. Many medieval buildings, they build the Gothic style, which requires precise balances and calculation. Using what? Using the same concept that Newton later formalized. However, these elements of statics and uh, dynamics were already known before, only they were interpreted differently. What in particular is worth knowing about your books? That is, what is the thing that you think is most important to know through reading your books? Uh, to start thinking for yourself, with your head, not regarding what others say, not trusting so much of Galileo, Newton or Einstein, but starting to think of what one is studying corresponds to reality. It is not that these great scientists have done everything wrong, but in some fields, in some sectors of their studies, their way of thinking, we find their personality also was being introduced in over reality. It is no longer pure science, but it's exploitative or ideology science. They criticize the Christian philosophers because they had a Christian worldview. In contrast, they were Pythagorean, and they had a Pythagorean ideological worldview. They practically used the same methods. So the influence of Pythagoras was remarkable. It was remarkable and still is remarkable. Here, when we wrote to agree on this interview, day, hour, and so on, you told me that you were also working on something else. You want to talk about it, Professor? Yes, uh, it concerns the latest publication, the subject of things I finished because I no longer have to tell you anything. I said everything, I squeezed the lemon to the last drop. And what is the latest publication? Can you show it to us? The last. The last one is the counter story of heliocentrism. What must come out would be the stone, the final seal. Perhaps I want to give it the title of the heliocentric crusade against common sense, in which I practically make the synthesis, the sum of everything I have studied in recent years with reference to such scientists, Copernicus, Kepler, Galileo, up to Einstein to show just how the Pythagorean mentality of these great characters has greatly influenced their theories. I also went to find the contacts that these people, these scientists had with the esoteric dimension, with initiatory esoteric circles. Have you had the opportunity to deepen or critically analyze the theory, I still call it Newton's theory of gravity, what do you think about it? It has long since faded. Newton's theory of gravity has already faded with Einstein. The force of gravity does not exist. That is, the deformation of the fields is demonstrated in the gravitational field. Einstein demonstrated it. Then that of uh, Newton is taken from Pythagoras because Pythagoras studying the harmonies, the properties of the string, he had sensed this relationship between planets and bodies of attraction. And Newton himself in knowledge is having drawn from Pythagoras, from the writings of Pythagoras, of the Pythagoreans, this theory of gravitation. I think I have found something about gravity, that is, the non-existence of gravity, as Newton tells us, always in a science book by Alberto Magno, around 1200. So let's imagine a little bit he has not refuted it, that is, Alberto Magno actually explains what it is, that it is not a force of gravity, as Newton told us, in which he very candidly stated that he could not explain the reason for this gravity. Professor, your books, where can one find them? Uh, now they are almost all sold out. They can be found on the internet, I think, from the publishing house, or from me. I also sent someone at my expenses. 
because in general I have always lost money. Why? Because I think it's worth losing out because the more someone loses, the more he believes in what he wrote.